morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Oh, I was afraid my yellow pages are next. <laughs> the joy of, of our kids cannot be uh, paralleled by anything we adults can do, really. It's so good to see you back, uh, back in uh, the sanctuary. Uh, last Sabbath, we went to the beach, some of us, and then uh, some of us were here. I want to thank those that uh, were at the beach and organized there, Pastor Lynette, Pastor Tanya, Elder Julie, and uh, to those that were on duty here, uh, Elder Byron, Elder Nick, it was uh, good to know that all fronts were covered, and I would like to give a shout out to all those that were baptized last Sabbath at the beach. Yes, 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 yes. Next, next Sabbath, Pastor Tanya is going to uh, introduce them to you and also uh, hand them their baptismal certificate and a special gift from the church. I hate you, then I love you. Yeah, that comes from a song. This sermon is uh, for you if you are married. And this sermon is for you if you are not married, but contemplate marriage, or you are not married any longer, or if you contemplate divorce, or if uh, you just know somebody that is married and you would like to be able to help, or if you don't even care about marriage, but you have an intellectual curiosity to know what would be normal for a marriage, or if you don't find yourself in any of these categories, then this sermon is for you. I'd like to run away from you. That's a song majestically sung by Luciano Pavarotti and Celine Dion. Pretty big names, right? I'd like to run away from you, but if I were to leave you, I would die. I'd like to break the chains you put around me, and yet I'll never try. No matter what you do, you drive me crazy. I'd rather be alone, but then I know my life would be so empty as soon as you were gone. Impossible to live with you, but I could never live without you. For whatever you do, I never, never, never want to be in love with anyone but you. And now it comes. You make me sad. You make me strong. You make me mad. You make me long for you. You make me live. You make me die. You make me laugh. You make me cry for you. You treat me wrong. You treat me right. You let me be. You make me fight with you. You make me high, you bring me down, you set me free, you hold me bound to you. I hate you, then I love you, then I love you, then I hate you, then I love you more. For whatever you do, I never, never, never want to be in love with anyone but you. <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> Is that marriage? <laughs> uh, a roller coaster? <laughs> yep. <laughs> a hurricane? And uh, all those uh, winds and waves are done by the other, and all the love and hate is produced by the other, and you just keep on riding? And you know, some people can take the ride, they can even enjoy the roller coaster, but 
After a few rounds, some others would uh, have some stomach pain, and they can even throw up. It's too much, simply too much for them, right? Question is, is that the way of life that Jesus Christ offers to us? I am the way, he says. And uh, the Apostle Paul speaks about the way of life in Jesus Christ in many different ways in trying to instill the same idea, walk in the good works of God prepared, that God prepared, walk in the truth as it is in Jesus, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, walk in love, walk circumspectly or correctly as wise. It never says walk in hate. I hate you, then I love you. Then I love you, then I hate you. So how is it then? Let us pray and go to it. Lord, it's, it's hard to take your words sometimes, but we know that's what gives life. And we pray for your blessing and wisdom in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would like to start reading, I, I, I'll take a few steps back, and then we are going where we are looking today. See that you work circumspectly. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 17, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand or put together what the will or desire of the Lord is. 18, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And please notice now that there are three verbs, ing verbs, speaking, gerund, right? Speaking, giving, submitting. All three come out from the same idea of being filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. That's my Thanksgiving sermon in there. But then verse 21 says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Please keep that verse in mind. Submitting to one another, to one another in the fear of God. And now, buckle up, okay? Because uh, we are starting. Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. In everything? And the man said, Amen. <laughs> and uh, the, the women said, Brother Paul, what's wrong with you? Don't you realize you kind of sound uh, like a misogynistic bully? How, how can you in the 21st century give us that kind of advice? Don't you know that throughout history, your words have been used as an endorsement for holy domestic violence? And to this day, there are still people that use Paul's words to endorse and uh, to 
somehow excuse at least the subjugation, the abuse of women. Not long ago, you may have heard about it, it was on the East Coast, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor preached from the pulpit that if you are to commit a rape, then you better rape your wife because she belongs to you. That was said in the pulpit. She was kicked out. He was kicked out after that. But, but it happens. And, and you know, thinking about these kind of realities, you, you may uh, say, okay, so uh, what kind of relevance does this have for 21st century families or for my marriage, the one that is or the, the one that is broken or that is no longer or that will be in the future. Well, please understand something. When you see something difficult in the Bible, okay, something challenging in the Bible, please don't skip it, okay? <laughs> don't act as if it is not there. But try to understand what is being said in that context when it was written and try to see how it can apply to these days. Now, the Apostle Paul can be very tricky to read and to understand. He can say something here and then he can say something over here and you have the impression he says the exact opposite. Now he has a problem against the law, it seems. Now he says the law is so good. And you're like, huh? Now he says in the cha same chapter, for instance, in Ephesians, he says, be kind, be gentle. And then he says, be angry. Huh? But those things are not contradictions. Those are realities that compose the big picture. So now in this context, please notice where the emphasis is. Move to the next slide, and please notice those highlighted words. Wives, submit doesn't even appear in the Greek text, but is understood from the previous verse, because the previous verse was submit to one another. And then it continues, wives to your own husbands. What's the word? As to the Lord. Now, let me ask you, is anybody here supposed to submit to the Lord? Good. For the husband is head of the wife, as also, again, that's very important, Christ is head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. This is the focus, that's a little chiasm there, and He is the Savior of the body, that's the focal point of the chiasm. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, this is part of a longer passage. Many people have stopped only reading this part, especially men. Enjoy it reading verses 22, 23, and 24, then uh, stop. But I would like to illustrate to you to see what is going on there. The whole segment is from 22 through 33, that is 12 verses total. And only three out of uh, those 12 verses speak about women or are addressed to women. So let me illustrate this. You have one-fourth, two-fourths, three-fourths, and four-fourths. That's the whole passage. Out of the whole passage, only this segment deals with the women. Two verses there, 22 and 
24, and there is a half verse, verse 33, you have it up there, verse 30, 33, that half verse, and let the wife see that she respects, some old translations say fears, the husband. But let me go back to my illustration. If you have a section in which one-fourth is about women and uh, three-fourths are about men, what is the text, the passage about? Women are shy. <laughs> so see, see what the dilemma is? Because if you only focus on that verse, you have the impression there is a problem there. Because uh, the question is this, why is it that the man is the head of the wife, husband, the man of the wife? I would like to make seven points first for the big picture, and then I will try to answer that question biblically. The first point I would like to make is this. The basic paradigm of the passage, please understand that, is submit to one another. Have we seen that? That's how it starts in verse 21. Submit to one another. So the rule is not, or the, the basic paradigm is not rule one another. It is submit to one another. Second, wives are to submit to their own husbands, not to anybody else's husband. And not all women submitted to all men. Like the group of women submitted to all the men. Mm -mm. I've been pastoring uh, in the past. I, I, I pastored a church, a small little company out in the village, in which it happened that I only had one man and a bunch of women. And the man was behaving like the rooster in the hen's house. He would always tell me, yeah, pastor, I know. There are here women more capable than me. They can preach better than me. He was having a hard time even reading. But he was the man. You know? And he had this impression that just because he's a male and not a female, he is the head of all the female of the church if not all the world. Because it's the same kind of frame of mind. Third point, the submission of the wife is voluntary. It is not a forceful subjugation by the husband. It's not the husband putting her, subjugating her. No, no, the text doesn't say that, right? Four, the submission of the wife is not blind yielding. Therefore, the husband is to emulate Jesus Christ as head. That's the only way it applies. If the husband doesn't emulate Jesus Christ as the head, does it apply? Uh -uh. Five. Submitting in everything does not include sin. A Christ-like head will not ask for sinful things from his wife. I was called once, a long time ago, by a sister, wife of a Christian husband, asking, because she was puzzled, asking for advice, Pastor, what should I do? He forces me to go with him to nightclubs. And he was a Christian. No, no. This is not about those kind of relationships. Okay? Six. The wife is to submit to her husband as to the Lord, not instead of the Lord. That's different. It's one thing to submit as to the Lord, and it's something else to submit instead of the Lord. Which means, point seven, 
that the husband does not take the place of the Lord. The Lord keeps on being the head of both, both the husband and the wife. So then, coming back to the same question, why is it that Paul says that the husband is the head of the wife, just like Christ is the head of the church? Shouldn't be this relationship mutual? Because if the basic paradigm is submit to one another, then you would think, okay, so that means there are moments when this submits to this head, right? And there are moments, what moments? When this submits to this head. Does that make sense? If it's mutual. Now, biblically, according to creation, when God created Adam and Eve, the relationship was mutual. Just like Paul says, submit to one another. And the gospel wants to bring us back to the same kind of mutual submission. Submit to one another. How do I know? Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. What the text says is this. Paul lives in a society where the Jew is up here and the Gentile, the, the Greek, is down here. The Jew is the head, the Greek cannot be. It's a different kind of relationship. Then there is slaves and there is masters. Slaves and masters. The master is up here, the slave is down here. And then there is male and female. The male is up here and the female is down here. What does Paul say? Uh -uh. In Christ Jesus, no, none of those. In Christ Jesus, we are all one. But somebody may ask here, Pastor, but doesn't the Bible say that from the very moment of creation, women were created subordinate to men? What do you think? Some argue like this. The order of creation is Adam was created first and then Eve was created, which means that Adam has priority over Eve. Adam is superior to Eve. What they miss, however, is that the creation account in chapter 2 where the creation of Adam and Eve is described is a beautiful chiasm, and on one end of the chiasm, it's like this. This is what a chiasm looks like, like this. On this end of the chiasm, you have a description of the creation of Adam, and on this end of the chiasm, a description of the creation of Eve. What is amazing is that the same number of Hebrew words is employed in both descriptions. That's what you have on screen. Can you please read it for me? Okay. No, but you can count the words at least, and you will find that it's 16 on one side and 16 on the other side. Because the story of creation there does not move from inferior, somebody inferior, to superior, as if Adam was inferior and then Eve was superior, but neither does it go the other way around as if Adam was superior and then Eve was created as an inferior. The story moves from incomplete. God looks at Adam and says, it's not good for him to be alone. He's incomplete. And then God gives him what? A counterpart so that he will be now complete. It moves from incomplete to complete. 
Oh, interesting. But then somebody will say, oh, but doesn't the Bible say that Eve was created to be a helper for Adam? So then how is it the same? In English, the word helper or assistant carries this idea of subordinate or lower ranking, right? The helper, the assistant helps the higher ranking officer, say. But does that apply in biblical language? Because this is what the biblical picture is, and I would like to show it to you. The biblical picture is this. You have Adam. He's not complete. God creates a helper for him comparable to him. A helper that is a counterpart. A helper that is, in biblical language, face to face. And the word helper does not uh, carry the meaning of subordinate or inferior ranking. Because, for instance, in the Bible, God is called the helper of Israel. God is the helper of Israel. Can you imagine that the helper of Israel, God, is inferior in ranking to Israel? No. So if you want to argue on one side, you can equally argue on the other side. Wait, 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 somebody will say, but didn't God take Adam's rib? So Adam is the real deal, and out of Adam a, a rib is taken, and out of the rib Eve is created. Adam is superior, Eve as a derivative is inferior. But wait a moment, if you go by that argument, then Adam was taken from the dust. Is dust superior to Adam? Do you understand the logic of it? So it's, it's, it's a problematic, flawed way of processing. But look how Ellen White explains what the meaning of being taken from the rib me, is. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 46. Eve was created from a rib, taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an, please complete, as an, a what? As an, I need the word, yes. Equal, correct. Move that slide, please. Yes, equal. To be loved and protected by him. But this is mutual. It's equal. And when Adam first sees Eve, you know that moment when God brings Eve, created out of his rib, he sees Eve and he says, wow, you have the verse up there. Wow. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of men. And the Hebrew is, he shall, she shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. And this is Ish and this is Isha. And I want to show you something very interesting that scholars point out. That in Ish, you have the Yud here, which is a letter, and you have the hate over here, and they say, well, those two together are Yah, from where Yahweh comes, which is the name of God Himself. So we have, we have a beautiful artistic structural way of creating going on here. No, God did not take Eve from, from a, a, a piece of bone from here or from a piece of bone from the toe. God took 
a piece from the side, a rib that suggests equality. But then, what went wrong? It's obvious that something went wrong at the fall. And uh, you can read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, Genesis 3, verse 16, you will see that at the fall, God tells the woman, your desire shall be for your husband, and uh, he shall rule. And the word mashal is used over you. Please understand something here. The word mashal is not the same as the word marshal. Mashal is not the same word that is used earlier when Adam and Eve received dominion over the animals. That is rada in Hebrew. This is mashal. But the word mashal is used previously in a very interesting context, only once. So this is the second moment when it's used in Genesis 3.16 after the fall, but it's used once before the fall. Do you know where? Genesis 1.16, then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule, what? To mashal the day and the lesser light to rule mashal the night. Let me ask you, ruling the day and the night, is that this kind of ruling? What kind of ruling is it? It means to brighten the day. It means to bring on the light. So the context is Eve has fallen to the temptation of the devil. Her, her problems will start with that. She will be dependent on you, Adam. Her desires will be for you or after you. But you are there, Adam, for her to lighten, to illuminate her day, to bring the light on for her. In other words, this means that the role of the husband, head like Christ, is a redemptive, a sort of a messianic kind of role. Not in the sense that you are the Messiah for your wife, no. But in the sense that you are there to bring light to the darkness of life. And I would like now to read from Ellen White so that you, you will see I'm not coming up with this kind of explanation. Ellen White confirms the same thing. This is what she says. In the creation, God had made her, that is Eve, what? The equal of Adam. Had they remained obedient to God in harmony with this, His great law of love, they would ever have been in harmony with each other. Beautiful. And then she continues, but sin had brought discord and now their union could be maintained and harmony preserved only by submission on the part of the one or... Please notice that. The other. Did you catch what is going on there? So Ellen White suggests that the only way the harmony between the two now, after the fall, can be maintained is if one or the other submits either this to this or this to this. Now, question is, why is it still that in the Bible you will never find that the woman is called the head? The man is the head of the wife, not of any other woman. Why? Well, one thing can be that because Eve sinned first, then Adam was used by God so uh, he would bring some redemptive attitude to Eve. 
or maybe the destruction of sin in the women's psyche is of a nature that she needs that extra care from the husband. If you think this sounds crazy, let me say something. If you count male and female in this church, what will be the majority? Women, right? Is that only because that's the majority population of the world? No, because it outweighs the percentage. So it seems to me that there is something there. I don't know exactly what, and I don't even want to go there because that's not the point Paul is making. What Ellen White continues to say, please notice, is interesting. She says, had the principles enjoyed in the law of God been cherished by the fallen race, this sentence, though giving, growing out of the results of sin, would have proved a blessing to them. So this kind of relationship between the head, mashal, not uh, the rada, the dominion, no, no, the one that enlightens the day, should be a blessing. But something happened, she continues, but man's abuse of the supremacy thus given him has too often rendered the lot of women very bitter and made her life a burden. Now, that's the problem Paul is attacking in Hebrews chapter 5. Because after he speaks for one quarter of that passage to the women, telling them that they should submit to their husbands, that what was going on? This is what was going on. The gospel came to those people, and finally, the women of that society received value. They, they were valued by the gospel. Jesus Christ loves them too. And some stretched it too far, some of those women, and started to disrespect their husbands in public because now it was free to do it. And Paul says, no, 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 that's not good. No, no, wives have to submit to their husbands, but that is only the result, the effect of something. Let's now attack the cause, Paul says. What is the cause? Husbands, love your wives. That's the problem. The problem was husbands had a problem or a challenge loving their wives. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to her. What kind of love is that? I know a story. The people are passed away already, so I can use that story for no problem. When uh, this guy was an elder in the church, but in his youth he used to be a boxer. So then at one point he beat his wife up. And when he was asked, uh, why would you do that? He said he did it out of love. How come out of love? And he quoted the Bible. There's a Bible verse that he quoted. It is uh, Revelation chapter 3. You don't have Revelation chapter 3 there? It is the Bible verse. You may think it doesn't exist. No, there, there is a Bible verse. The Bible verse says that whoever God loves, He rebukes and chastens. That's Revelation chapter 3 in the message to Laodicea. So, poor brother took that verse, and based on that, he loved beating his wife. No, no. The love that is described there, uh, described there is self sacrificing love. Why does Christ love the church sacrificially? That he might sanctify, make her special, and cleanse her with or by the washing of the water by the word. Baptism is hinted there. The gospel is hinted there. But there's something beyond that. I don't know if you've ever heard about the nuptial bath that was used in the past. 
that is hinted there too. So make her holy, special, clean. Verse 27, why? Why? That he might present her to himself a glorious church, a glowing church, a beautiful, shining church, not having spot or stain or blemish or wrinkle of any su or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's Jesus Christ loving the church. And that's how I am supposed, and you, brother, too, to love your wife. And verse 28 says, so, he says, in this manner, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29, for no one ever, this no one ever, I think, should be taken somewhat like this. No one ever in his mind, uh, right mind, because there are people that harm their own body because of some, some mental illness. For no one ever in his right mind, I would say, hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Please notice those two words, nourishes and cherishes. Is that the same? No, no, no. It's two different concepts. The Bible says that God gives rain and sun to whom? To everybody. He nourishes everybody. But there is a way that God cherishes His church. God pours out gifts, special gifts, in His church. Now, apply to you and your wife, brother, listen carefully, you are to nourish your wife, to take care of her basic needs, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. But it doesn't stop there. That is the basics. That's nourishing. Now, I'll, I'll be beaten up at the end. But the next, the next level is this. You will not only nourish, you also cherish. And that's an extra level. Cherishing means to spoil, if you want, or to pamper. You enjoy it, wives, right? Or you would enjoy it. But let's read on. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined, glued together, or hooked, that's a good translation as well, to his wife. And the two shall come or become one flesh. And I would like to emphasize this. Men, please keep this in mind. The Bible never says the women will leave father and mother. The Bible says the men will leave father and mother. No, I'm serious. If the man doesn't leave father and mother, you're in trouble. A woman most likely will never leave father and mother. You don't believe me? Try it out. 32. This is a great mystery, says Paul. Even Paul is puzzled at this point. You know, I said, this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So what would you expect? It has to be a mystery, right? Because, because that's, that's the kind of relationship, Christ and the church. But then he concludes in verse 33, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular or individually, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects. The word in Greek is phobeo, from where phobias come. And it's translated by some with fear. 
Nevertheless, phobeo in Greek is polysemantic. It means different things. It means fear, it means reverence, it means respect. I'm showing there a uh, quote from Plato, as the last uh, slide it should be. Uh, Plato uses the idea of phobeo in relationship with the body. Obviously, he's not saying that you should uh, fear your own body. What he says is that you should respect your own body. I'm just using this to prove that the word was used in that sense as respect or doing what is appropriate or in the best interest or of something or somebody. I'm ready to wrap up, but I, I have to say a few words, especially to the men, because this is more to the men today. There is one quarter to the women, but most of it goes to the men. And I want to say a few words that will probably cost me. <laughs> you know, when, when uh, my beautiful and lovely and uh, deeply loving wife got to know me when, when we first met, so to speak, I was a weirdo. Not that too much changed, but it's been a long way, I can assure you. I was one of those guys that would wear sandals and socks together, <laughs> if you can imagine that. <laughs> and, then, and then dockers, not that I have any problem with dockers, but not for my age group at that time, you know, I, I was 20-something, or 30-ish. Two, two numbers, two sizes bigger than I needed. Even my, uh, my church attire, suits, were two numbers bigger than I, I really needed. So, uh, if something happened, it's because she not only nurtured me or nourished me, she also cherished me. That's different. Because nourishing is the basics. Cherishing is spoiling or pampering. Okay? But you, do, you still don't know where I'm going. Now, I often find myself in the situation when a young lady or a woman looking for a husband tells me, Pastor, there are no eligible uh, men out there. Look at them. Look, look, look at what they look like. No? It's like, how? No, I mean, when I, when I just see them, you know, and I always tell them, listen, a good wife, a good woman, a woman that, that knows how to cherish a man can make anything out of that man. Raise your hand if you agree. Okay? I mean, that's the nature of reality. Now, what I did not know until this last week is that the Bible teaches me, the husband, that that is, I'm not saying it's not her responsibility as well, because in the gospel, we are mutual, same level. That's that's why love is needed, divine love. That's what the gospel brings. It's leveling it back to mutual relationship. But why, what I didn't know is that the Bible teaches me that I should not only nourish, and I think I am good at nourishing. Because in a good Seventh-day Adventist culture, we are te taught how to nourish Seventh-day Adventists usually are very pragmatic people, aren't they? We know what is principle, what is not principle, what is needed, what is not needed. We supply the needs. But in Seventh-day Adventism, we don't have a strong culture for cherishing. Men, listen carefully. The Bible says that we should nourish 
our wives and cherish our wives. If you don't know how that translates for 21st century, the Bible explicitly says that you should go to a flower store and buy flowers for your wife. That's one example. Not because she needs them. She would be able to live without them. And some may not like them, so don't buy flowers if she doesn't like them. If she only likes a Volvo, that's a different uh, thing. You, you can probably buy that one. But get my point, please. The Bible teaches you and me that we should nourish and cherish. Nourish is just the basics. Cherish is that extra that Christ gives to the church. That you only, watch this, the nourish can go beyond your wife. You have daughters, you have family members, you have people in need that need you to nourish. The cherish that only goes to your wife. And now that you are ready to bring me down, let me close the way Paul closes the chapter. That's verse 33. Verse 33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. And I, I have to read that one too. Let the wife see C is supplied. In the Greek, the C does not appear like that. And let the wife respect her husband. And everybody jumping said, Amen, Amen, Amen. <laughs> amen. 